Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnell. Welcome back to my Art and Ministry channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So as you know, winter is basically here at our doorstep and instead of doing another one of my signature or traditional paintings as far as using a paintbrush, I wanted to go back and visit the paint pouring arena and just have some fun in that department by only using cool colors to reflect the new season. I even got my nails done in cool colors, so that's how in the mood I am to do this painting. Um, as far as the composition goes, I wanted to do a wrecked swipe. So I really just wanted to kind of swipe some colors over the top and then just add some embellishments in there. And hopefully it'll turn out as pretty as I have it in my mind. <laughs> but before we get started, today's ministry snack comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And it reads, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came down and were ministering to him. So the Gospel of Matthew, of course, was written by one of Jesus' disciples. But before we dive into the word, I just want to let you guys know my messages are given to you with the best of my understanding. Now, it seems really contradicting to hear that, you know, Satan is the ruler of the earth, yet we also hear that God's in control, you know. So here's where I want to help make better sense or give more clarity of that, especially for those who are new to the Bible or just anybody who hasn't really had a chance to dig around. Now, it's important to take note that Satan is known by a plethora of names, or he has a plethora of names. I'm not going to list them all, but I am going to mention the most commonly used names throughout the Bible, aside from Satan, of course, which is also known as, or he's also known as the father of lies, the great deceiver, the prince in the power of the air, the prince or god of this earth. Um, and when I'm mentioning God or him as a god, I am literally using a lowercase or little g, whereas our god almighty has a capital g when we are referencing him. Um, he's also known as the destroyer and again those are all just to name a few so that we can better identify him coming to us at all angles because if you think about it for him having you know a name or a reference as being the prince or ruler of this earth doesn't exactly sound scary or anything that we or me you know by not knowing anything or not knowing any better it doesn't sound like a name that i would have to immediately take caution or put up a bunch of walls or have my awareness radar going off or anything, you know? Uh, and so that's where I think it's super important to know just what these names mean. And that's the message I want to unpack. Now, I believe the Gospels of Luke and Mark also have an account on this, but for the passage remix or breakdown, starting in verse eight, where it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. So I'm going to briefly backpedal for you for a second to try to catch you up plus we are starting in the middle of a sentence which is an odd place for me to start sharing the word but anyways at this point in time jesus had left his disciples to go spend some time in prayer as he typically did only this time is for a much longer period of time as in 40 days and 40 nights oh and by the way don't try going that long without food and water the way he did um, most of us would be hospitalized some of us probably even dead uh, so yeah, but this is something he knew that he could handle, you know, therefore I do not recommend anybody trying to take on this kind or level of fasting. Now, because Jesus was fully man, aside from also being fully God, you better believe he was a starving Marvin, but that's not the point. The point is at this time, like I said, he was away from his disciples to be in prayer, but he was led into the wilderness also where he had met up with Satan, or really I should say Satan met up with him ultimately trying to get him to give into temptation and sin just like every other flawed human being does. Don't forget that temptation itself is not sin. It's the act of giving into that temptation is what causes the sin. Like trust me when I say how tempting it is, for me at least, but how tempting it is to mow down an entire pint of my favorite mint chocolate chip ice cream, but I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't give in to that temptation you know first off that's gluttony and second off um i just know my i know the consequences my body would blow at both ends so to speak actually it probably really would i'm sorry i know this that's tmi and like i said i know the damage and discomfort it will cause which will last a lot longer than the taste and that goes for any temptation that turns into sin the damage or the consequence of that sin will always last longer than the fun or satisfaction part of it. But that doesn't mean I can resist all temptation. I mean, some things I just can't help. I mean, hello, I'm 
human. I sure sin a lot less now that I'm a child of God, but I will always sin. However, that said, that doesn't mean that it's okay to intentionally live in sin, you know, and just have that mindset like, oh, well, whatever, you know, God will forgive me and just continue to live how we carelessly live in that manner. Because if that's the case, then we're technically not children of God. Rather, we are still children of the enemy, which is another message for another time. And like I just mentioned earlier, how Jesus was also fully human, Satan was sure that he'd give in to his temptation too, just like everybody else eventually does at some point. So where it says again is when Satan had already tried twice. So this was his third attempt. Now, the first two things were measly, small temptations, you know. But something to keep in mind though, it doesn't matter how you sin, big or small, a sin is a sin is a sin. They are all equal. So throw away your measuring scale because there is no such thing as the lesser of two evils. You will not find anything in the Bible that says that God doesn't mind one thing more or less than the other because that just simply doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because all sin is evil and equal. Plain and simple, period. That's Satan's handiwork, getting us to believe otherwise so that we won't feel so bad about some of our sin. To keep us sinning. So because the first two didn't interest Jesus or tempt him enough, Satan was pretty sure that the third one would be the one that would totally do him in, you know, which is why and when he brought him to the top of this really tall mountain, which is also called or noted as Mount of Temptation, which was overlooking the Judean desert in the city of Jericho. I believe that is currently in the country of Palestine or Palestine. So as in verse 8, it continues to say, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Some translations might use the word splendor in place of the word glory, but I'll explain that in just a second. So Satan is giving Jesus a, a bird's eye view of the world. Now, if we're standing on top of a mountain, of course, we're not going to actually see the world, nor would we see it even flying in an airplane at a average flight level or altitude of 37,000 feet. We would nearly just get a glimpse of it, although that glimpse could surely feel like it's the world because of its vastness. Well, Jesus and Satan have a different set of eyes than we do. They're able to see things in and from a different perspective. So in this instance, Satan is showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory so that he's not shortchanging him of anything he could possibly want to covet or show any greed over. And again, some translations may use the word nations in place of the word kingdoms, but as we know, all nations have rulers or kingdoms, and all of the glory or splendor is the glory of the people. That means our fleshly desires, our idols, our possessions, anything and everything that we make number one in our lives as opposed to making God number one. Uh, so all of our stuff or splendor is the glory of the people, not God himself the way it should be, if I'm making sense. Plus, I believe that by Satan bringing Jesus so high up was just for a physical reminder of how much higher or above he would be than everybody else, as in a status symbol type thing. But Jesus already knows he's the highest, and Satan does too. It's just that Satan wants Jesus to be flawed and expose him of any potential pride too. Remember, Satan was cast down because he had pride. And he just wants Jesus to go down to, my guess is particularly in the same way, because pride is also a sin, which is way different than being proud of your kids or where you're born type thing. And we all know or should know that Jesus doesn't care about status. He never has. Matter of fact, because he cares so little about it is why he chose to take off his crown and he chose to dwell among us sinners, among the poor and the needy. Um, and why he chose to be born in an animal stable laying in a feeding trough versus being on a comfortable Tempur-Pedic with electric blankets, just to name some examples. Now listen up, moving on to verse 9, it says, And he, Satan, said to him, All these I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Did you catch that? I will give you, he says. So where the heck did he get the whole world and all the glory to begin with? Isn't it God's? Because last time I checked or heard, there's even songs out there saying so, that God's got the whole world in his hands. Now let's briefly go back to the beginning of time, so back to the book of Genesis, when God created the earth and all that dwelt in it. So of course mankind was his crowning achievement, and because he loved his best work so much, which is us, he literally gave dominion of the earth to mankind, or really Adam because he was first born, but he trusted he would keep it special and sacred for everyone else. Let me say that again. He literally gave 
Adam and Eve the world as a gift. Like, here you go, enjoy. I made this for you. Take care of it as I take care of you. Well, one day, as most of us know, the serpent or Satan was in the garden chatting it up with Eve, who got her to think otherwise about God, questioning his word, his promises, his very nature, who then turned to Adam and got him to go along with her new doubts about God and ultimately got him to sin right alongside with her. So keep in mind, the devil didn't tell Eve to kill someone or steal anything. He simply got her to question and doubt God. And his tactics for us haven't changed a bit. He doesn't need to do much else anyways, because that's how effective his deception is. So you can't ever say, well, the devil made me do it. Nope, that was a choice to give in to temptation and sin, making us doubt what was wrong to do in the first place. Notice God didn't step in and tell Satan to back off. He gave Adam and Eve free will. So in other words, he gave them the opportunity to make choices. He never forced his rules on them. He just simply told them what they are and what the consequences are, hoping that his word would be all that they needed. That said, he doesn't force his rules on us, nor does he force us to love him in return. He simply gives us choices hence our freedom to make choices in life. Anyway, that disobedience was the ultimate curse on the human race and the rest of the world, which is why it was planned for Jesus to come to ultimately save and redeem the human race and the whole world because God knew what Adam and Eve did was super messed up. That disobedience was also Adam essentially handing over the very special gift that God made himself right into the hands of the enemy. They basically traded a perfect and timeless world and our perfect selves for their moments of doubt and sin. Luke's gospel also confirms this, how the enemy says in the same context, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. So as you can see, Satan was referencing Adam and how Adam hand delivered the once perfect world as a gift right into the hands of the enemy, just like I said earlier. Now, I know it's easy to say or think, well, wait a minute, Eve, Eve sinned first, and she did. However, Adam was in charge. The Bible says that the man is always in charge of the household because he's the one that's held accountable. Again, a message for another time. Now, hopefully you could see here how the damage of our sin lasts longer than the fun of it. So that means we're fair game now. We all belong to Satan. We're also all now known as the children of the devil rather than being children of God. Hence the urgency we want to desire to be born again so that we can receive our free gift of salvation if we want to be all that we were meant to be and have all that we were meant to have for eternity with him. So on to verse 10, it says, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and only him you shall serve. So as you can see, Jesus was able to overcome temptation and any weakness to bow his knee and serve the enemy instead of God. He basically told him to take a hike because what was written, Jesus wrote himself. He is the law. Again, Satan was just hoping that Jesus would have some kind of weak sauce in him, you know, so that he would forget his own words or law. Because Satan also knows the word of God. He knows it front to back, line by line, and the meaning and context of everything, which is why he wants to distort God's word for us so that we won't believe what it actually means or for us to come to repentance, which just means to have a change of heart, a change of mind, you know, and or want a relationship with him so that we will not be saved. Satan also wanted Jesus to essentially trade his holiness and perfection for the things of this world that will perish anyways, just as Satan will, and he knows it too. The bottom line is that Satan wanted Jesus to go down with him in end times if he worshiped him instead of worshiping God the Father instead. So it's clear that Satan knows his own fate and he was willing to step down from his earthly throne just to see Jesus eat it. Like that's how worth it it would be for him or to him to see Jesus give all that up. And finally in verse 11 is it says, Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So as the devil left Jesus, he too will leave us when we welcome the Holy Spirit to help us overcome that temptation or any temptation as Jesus was also tempted, um, especially when coupled with prayer and or simply um, when we put on the full armor of God. 
a very highly suggested task given by and written by the Apostle Paul that is written in the book of Ephesians, so chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. But the angels basically came down and they all put on party hats, celebrating Jesus' victory and success in overcoming temptation. Now, I'm going to read a few verses throughout the Bible confirming that Satan is the ruler of the earth or the prince of the earth and all those other names that I had mentioned, but I'm not going to break them down. They're really just to reiterate the fact. But first, I want to reiterate that God is still in control, always has been, always will be, and I'll share a few Bible verses too, also confirming that. So the world may belong to Satan, but it's technically not his. It's been allowed to be in his possession with supervision under God's authority. But first, let me paint a quick little picture here to help you better understand because I'm a visual learner. Maybe a lot of you guys are too. But anyways, think of how we give a room to our kids. You know, we call it their room, but you know, really it, it's, we're in control of it. It's our house. God has the title deed and full ownership of what rightfully belongs to him, which are the heavens and all of the earth and everything that expands out into space and beyond. So our kids have this little space, you know, and they can do whatever they want in there. They're under our authority. So you could think of God in the same way, if that's helpful. He's basically letting Satan run around his little room, you know, but still is bound by rules for a period of time though. And that too is another message for another time. Okay, so here we go. And I will also include these in the description for you if you happen to be a note taker. So let's start with uh, how the Bible starts calling Satan by these additional names that I had mentioned. So in the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Then on the book, onto the book of Ephesians chapter two, verses one to two, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Then next onto the book of first Corinthians chapter 10, verses nine to 10, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Then onto the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, it says, And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Next onto the gospel of John chapter 8, verse 44, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, can't help to break this part down but he basically killed all of god's blessings and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him when he lies he speaks of his own character or is a liar and father of lies and on to revelation chapter 12 verse 9 and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and satan the deceiver of the whole world now these are just a drop in the bucket but hopefully you were able to pick up on all those names but these names are just most commonly used within the Bible other than Satan or the devil or even the enemy. Finally, let's drink in all the verses that reiterate how God was, is, and always will be in control. So starting in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 11 through 12, yours, O Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. How about the book of Psalms, chapter 103, verse 19? The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Next, the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Next, the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 13. Also henceforth I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Next, on to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 17. Ah, oh, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And on to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 15, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords. Again, that's also a drop in the bucket. Now rest in the fact that what may feel or seem is out of control in this world. God is in control. He is working behind the scenes, even when we can't see it. And when we can't see it and we start to be fearful over what we can't see, 
That's when the enemy takes over and takes advantage of our fear to diminish any and all faith we have in him. Now, faith is not based on feelings because feelings come and go, whereas faith is based on being steadfast um, no matter what. And when we retain our steadfastness, we retain our faith, regardless of the circumstance or situation we may be going through or living in, we will see how God wins in the end and we will also experience our eternal heavenly setup forever in peace. All right, guys. Let's get started. I'm starting my project using a 16 inch round canvas with a custom blue mix that I scraped for my table as the base color. I'm adding a little extra because I want to tilt it so basically I'm factoring that extra paint in so I won't overstretch my lacing and then I torch out any air bubbles. So my first color I'm using a Prussian blue hue for contrast, an iridescent blue green, some silver for an accent color, an iridescent fairy tale blue that gives off sort of a purpley tint, an iridescent playful blue which looks more white but it gives off a blue tint, and finally I top it off with regular titanium white, however this one is mixed with Australian Floetrol whereas my other colors are mixed with US Floetrol. Now I'm taking my spatula and I'm trying to put it in the center line of the titanium white and gently drag it across the paint, and then of course I'll repeat the process on the other side. All right, time to tilt this thing. I'm gonna try to cover as much of the surface first as I can before I pour any excess paint off the sides and also try to achieve sort of an off-center look. Well, that doesn't really look off-center to me, but I am loving the gorgeous lacing. Believe it or not, I'm really not sure if I even want to wreck it at this point. I love it how it is, but I did say I want to wreck it. So here we go. Wow, that's beautiful. I was really scared that I'd literally wreck it, you know? Now, because this still looks too centered, I'm gonna tilt it some again. Hopefully, I still have enough paint to help it move without overstretching my lacing or distorting my swirly lines either. Okay, that is much better. Although I was trying to get the line to curve a little more too, you know, to sort of follow the contour line of the canvas, but yeah, oh well, it's still beautiful. I really love how this turned out, but I am gonna make a couple last minute tweaks and see if I can fix some of my swirly lines before I bring you down for a close up. So here's the close up. The only bummer is my swirls aren't as perfect and tight as they were the first time around, but they're pretty darn close and I still love it. And so now stand by for the dried result to hopefully see all those iridescent colors come through. Look at that. It dried beautifully and those iridescent colors came through so nicely. It really does remind me of a very cold and wintry piece. 
This was my first time using Australian Flow Troll 2. My husband got me some as a gift, and so I've been so anxious to give it a shot. But for those who can't get their hands on any for any reason, there's a guy who has a channel called Left Brain Artist. He has several demo and tutorial videos showing how to achieve identical, if not very similar looks as far as the lacing effects go using alternative products local in the US. So be sure to check out his channel if you want more info. Plus, I like how he gets into the weeds, so to speak, a lot, really explaining the behind the scenes of acrylic pouring. But anyways, these swirly lines remind me of twirling and dancing. And given that this painting has a very cool and icy color theme going to it, I'm gonna call this Dancing on the Ice. So before I sign off, I wanna read the artist creed to you that I enjoy so much so that the next time you're painting, you find God's peace, protection, and guidance in your work as it reads, I believe my talents are a gift from God and I am to use them to fulfill his purposes in my life and in his world. I humbly acknowledge and accept my gifts as I ask to receive God's vision for how I am to use them. I ask the Holy Spirit to free me from self-doubt and self-absorption. I pray this work will bring me into closer alignment with God's plan for me as I seek to bring my gifts and talents into his light and to become the whole and complete person he intends me to be. Amen. Alrighty, so that concludes this demo and if you liked it, it would mean a whole lot to me if you shared it as well as hit that like and subscribe button for more videos as any action shows your much appreciated support. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.